Hi, welcome back to another uh, podcast of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. The Global Network was created in 1992 in order to keep the arms race from moving into space. You can support the show by clicking on the like button and also by subscribing to our YouTube channel. And please check out our website, spaceforpeace.org. We thank Global Network uh, board member Will Griffin for doing all the tech work on the show today. And our guest this time is Bob Anderson, who lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He helps coordinate the group Stop the War Machine. And he's also a board member of the Global Network. Bob, welcome to the show. Hey, Bruce. Thank you. Glad to be here. You're a Vietnam War veteran. Could you tell us a bit about that experience and how it changed you? Uh, good question, Bruce. Uh, I uh, sort of goes back. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a hillbilly, actually, eastern Tennessee hillbilly. And I grew up in a sort of a really rural area. And I never finished high school. I had to go to work, help my family. And then the Vietnam War comes along. And I thought, well, that's a patriotic thing to do. Uh, I believed in a lot of the th- teachings that we had had in school in those days. And so I, uh, I enlisted, joined the Air Force. And then about f- during the course of a four-year term, I did a lot of things, worked on uh, aviation, uh, fighter aircraft, electronics and stuff, and got into explosive ordnance disposal, which is bomb disposal. And then eventually I got got sent to uh, Southeast Asia. And I call it Southeast Asia because um, – I traveled around all over the area in our job. We were doing pilot rescue, the aircraft are down, or um, if we had, if uh, pilots, uh, planes crashed and they had a lot of bombs on them and or weapons or secret black boxes and things, we had to get in there and uh, get to them and destroy them uh, and using demolitions and tactics and things like that. So that took me all over the place. I was into the Ho Chi Minh Trail area and, um, uh, one of the things about that time in the service that I thought really impacted me was uh, I, um, because we had a top secret clearance for all this work that we were doing, supposedly. And um, I uh, I was sent into the areas of Laos. Um, we were closer to North Vietnam or Hanoi than we were to Saigon, for example, when we were working in that area. And it was all covert. And I, I was assigned to a group of um, demolition people that were working with the uh, CIA in the covert operations in, La- in Laos. Now, what really struck me about that at the time, I thought, well, this is really gung ho, James Bond kind of stuff. You know, you had all those images and everything in there. And then I began to uh, notice things weren't quite right. I got off the plane, a plane one day, a little. Uh, covert plane that had no markings on it that we would fly around and land little airstrips all over Laos. And I got off one day and there were some green berets that were doing the same thing we were doing over the, over there. They were, we were all training and advising the Laotian uh, Hmong uh, tribesmen to fight for us. And we were in civilian clothes and um, we didn't carry any kind of obvious weapons or anything, but they were right there with us and, and all that. And I had a, they took our military ID cards and they issued us State Department um, cards. Supposedly, I worked for Agency for International Development doing agriculture uh, programs in, in Laos. And they had told us along the way that if we got killed anywhere in there, that our parents and family would be told that we were killed in an auto accident somewhere in Thailand or uh, somewhere like that that was innocuous and everything. But one day I was getting off this plane and uh, these Green Beret guys were talking to some of these uh, tribesmen we were working with, young boys and young kids. And they were telling us, OK, from here on, we're going to use cameras. We're not going to be cutting off ears to show evidence of uh, people that you've uh, taken and killed. And I stand there and I looked at this, you know, and I listened to them for a while. And I thought to myself, well, I don't know about this. So it's one of those things I filed back in my mind. I said I wasn't too comfortable with this kind of a thing. I didn't know what was going on. And then, and then along the way, I was there during the Tet Offensive in uh, 
1968. And so it was real heavy and intense. And so I would uh, get a chance later on to read in the Stars and Stripes of, diff of different actions that had taken place in that area. And then my parents would send me newspaper clippings, too, uh, of what we were doing over there. And I'd read these articles. And I was in some of the locations that they were talking about these actions. And I began to realize, you know, what they were telling the public and the American people was not what I was seeing and what we were doing on the ground. Because, you know, they were always saying, well, you're, we're going to be home by Christmas and we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, kind of thing. So you're always thinking, well, this war is going to be over any day now and we're going to have peace and everything. And I was beginning to realize, you know, something wasn't quite right on this. And then along the way, I had made friends with some of the um, Thai and Laotian people uh, along the way. And I realized, you know, these people really don't like dislike us. They don't hate us. Actually, they want to be like us. They'd like to have some blue jeans and T-shirts and, and some of the amenities that we have in life. And I began to think about this. And and one of the things that really impressed me was this little town that we were based in in Thailand called NKP. Downtown on the town square, they had a big clock. And a picture on it was, on top of it was Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh had lived in that area and been there uh, in his earlier organizing days and had been a local hero. And I didn't know this, you know, um, until later, until I got back to this country. Red. So anyway, all that began to bother me i was seeing uh, and i had a top secret clearance and i'm not supposed to talk about this stuff so i got back and um uh, later on i got discharged right after the tet offensive during that time frame and i came back and i wouldn't talk about any of that but i began to i was going to college i could use the gi bill and i said i'm going to go to college even though i never finished high school i said i'm going to give this a try and there was an anti-war movement on campus um, a lot of young students were uh, doing programs around ban the bomb, the anti-war kind of things. And I didn't really like these people, you know, that much. This is not too good, you know, a um, bunch of hippies and people. And uh, so I started listening to them. I go to the, the they were having rallies on campus uh, like you used to do, you know, stand outside the base and things like that and talk to people. And I'd go standing around and listen to them, and, and they'd have speakers. And uh, I think Rennie Davis came one time to speak at our campus. And so I began to realize that the analysis that these people had was a much better political view of the world and what was going on than what I had been told and uh, brought up with. And and I had um, uh, I just began to think, you know, something's not right here. And so I began, I began to hang out with more of their groups and, and their people and talk to them. And it was uh, changing my mind. And, you know, along the way, that one of them, some of them that year, they asked me, if they, they said, we're going up this place in New York called Woodstock. There's this big, big, big concert going on. You want to go with us? And I, and I thought to myself, I don't know, these people I don't know if, about this crowd or not. Darn, I wish now I'd gone with them, you know, looking back on that history. So all that, all those little things began to, you know, like uh, the, the experience in Vietnam showed me that uh, I began to realize, you know, just killing people and all the technology. I was good. I was getting good at technology and and learning all the the tricks and things that we were doing with weapons and things like that. And uh, I began to think, you know, there's got to be a better way of of changing the world than than uh, killing people. There was just too much of that going on there. So I began to move away from all that and. I had thought about going back in the Air Force. I would have liked to have been a pilot and fly, just fly planes. But I realized I'd have to bomb people or shoot them, you know, with the aircraft. And and I just said, I, you know, I don't want to do that. And about that time, the environmental movement was real big and the EPA was created and things like that. And there were massive demonstrations in the country. And I began to see this. I said, you know, there's there's another viewpoint out there. And other people got a better idea of, of all these kind of things. And so I gradually moved away from that. And it was rough for my family. My father was had been in World War II and um, very patriotic. And he couldn't understand uh, the changes that uh, was going on. And I was going through and things like that. So I just realized that the war was was wrong, you know. And like you were, we were talking one time before, I, in the, some of the bases I was at, there were people who would be outside uh, holding signs or uh, trying to talk to people. And and those things began to, uh, at first I, I wrote my congressman about these people. I said, you know, these, these people are doing something bad here. You know, they're, they're undermining the morale in the war, which was good. 
<laughs> and, uh, and so all that, you know, I began to have some effect on me and, uh, and everything. And I moved away from the, the whole Vietnam kind of thing. And, and nowadays it bothers me. People say, thank you for your service. You know, there's this big war push on now, you know, to glorify the military and the police and all those kind of things. And, and that really disturbs me. And I try to get into a conversation with them. I said, you don't know what it was really about. Right. So. All right. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I want to move to uh, Wounded Knee in South yeah. Dakota. Uh, you joined the Wounded Knee occupation in 1973 when about 200 uh, Oglala Lakota and their and f other followers of the American Indian movement occupied the town of Wounded Knee in South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And then recently you went back there for a uh, kind of reunion ceremony. So could you talk about 73 and then uh, going back there? In yeah. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was the 50th reunion we just had up there 50 years ago. Um that was 1973. I had finished an undergraduate course in, in uh, University of South Florida in Tampa, and I moved out here to Albuquerque to, uh, I don't know, the uh, there was an anti-war movement here that was pretty big, and, and I was hanging out with people. And along the time, the uh, American Indian Movement, AIM, had been doing a, a series of national demonstrations against oppression and racism towards uh, Native American people. And at that time, you know, and this is where literature is really important, and a lot of people are reading uh, D. Brown's book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. So there was, and there was a lot of the books, uh, House Made of Dawn and things like that. Um, so the consciousness of real high. And then AIM had been, they had taken over Alcatraz before that. They had also done, taken over the BIA headquarters in Washington, D.C. And the federal government didn't know exactly how to handle this because there was a rising anti-imperialist consciousness among a lot of people in the country abroad because of the war. But then, it was also happening at home internally, too. People were beginning to make that connection. <clears throat> so I was here in Albuquerque, and we had a chapter of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. We were helping uh, vets, people like myself, by this time in my life, and to come to that. And we were, uh, and I had been to the VVAW founding convention in uh, Chicago. I uh, met a lot of the uh, people who later on went on to form Winter Soldier in those programs. So here we had some Native Americans and Hispanics in our chapter, and we were doing things. And then up in South Dakota, AIM had taken over the village uh, where the massacre had taken place in 1890. And um, hundreds of uh, Lakota and uh, people were killed, Bigfoot's uh, tribe were trying to surrender, but they'd just been massacred right in the middle of winter. And so the news got out, and Russell Means appeared on TV one day. We were all watching it, and, you know, and even news. He said, come help us. Well, us crazy young anti-war vets, we were all standing. We, I remember this. We were standing around a fire, a barrel fire at a memorial event one night for a guy. One of our people had been killed here. And we said, let's go help them. In the next couple of days, five of us got in a couple of cars, loaded all the stuff that we could think, you know, you would need in an armed struggle to uh, go defend a, a country, uh, people in their national independence. And we took off and we went to South Dakota. You know, and what was so funny about that? We thought we'd go there for a couple of days and come back. We didn't even take change of underwear with us. We didn't even take clothes or anything. We just got in cars and took off. Well, a lot of people were doing the same thing. We, we, our group got there. It took us two days to drive there and get there from here. And it was snowing and cold weather and everything. But uh, we, we uh, got there and there was a major firefight going on. The federal government under Nixon at the point didn't know what to do with this mass protest that had a lot of public support. We managed to, to drive in right in the middle of a big firefight where the feds and the, and the ranchers and the goons were attacking the AIM people that had taken over the trading post in the area there. And we got there, and during that week, there must have been 500 people showed up there just like us. They were coming from all over the country to help the AIM uh, movement and the people there. So I did that, and we stayed there for the, the whole time, 70, 71 days. 
uh, a lot of stories in that. And I coming out of that, well, while I was there, the view, we had a lot of Vietnam veterans, as I said, that were going there. And all of us vets got together. We formed sort of a defense and security program for the village. And that was what sort of protected the place for the whole during the occupation because the feds had the marshals and the FBI on the other sides of our lines. We all dug bunkers. They dug bunkers and put APCs and armored personnel carriers in there. To, to, and they were had uh, 30 and 50 caliber machine guns. And they would rake across the village at night with the machine guns and places. And so we'd build a lot of bu- built bunkers on our own own sides to protect people. And um, we would stay, uh, stay uh, hunkered down there and, and try to defend that. But they knew that we knew what they were doing. And in our view, what we were doing was bringing the war home. We said, you know, we've been to Vietnam. We've seen what's going on there and what our country's doing. And it's just a connection with what was happening with Native American people being dispossessed from their lands and their culture and their life. And so it was a real high point in my life and a lot of other other vets' lives. And, and some of us still uh, talk about it and are still alive and around. And um, but it was a real it was a real dramatic moment. Um, so what the, happened at the uh, what happened at the reunion then? We we got together. This is the 50th reunion this year, and not a lot of people have passed away that were originally there, but there's enough around. And so Madonna Thunderhawk, who is in uh, Pine Ridge in Rapid City organized a lot of series of events. We just had a lot of powwows, a lot of uh, events and things and marches. And there was a gathering at the uh, burial site of, for, of the uh, 1890 victims. Gosh, I don't know. There must have been a thousand people probably showed up there. Um, it was cold, and snowy, muddy and wet, just like it had been <laughs> in the original days for us. So it was sort of like a, a going back home. And we had a good time getting together, and people rejuvenated, uh, came out of it stronger. But the key thing to it, I thought, was the youth. A lot of young people at this event. I sort of, at some of the powwows and stuff beforehand, it was sort of like, well, you know, some of us older, gray-haired kind of people were hanging around, you know. But by the time we got to the actual day of the uh, reunion, gosh, it was like so many young people. And I just felt really... It had been worthwhile doing that and standing up because people were talking about where they were going to go. The this fight is still on. The struggle is not over. And the big thing about Wounded Knee, I think, Bruce, that was really important is not for all of us individually, but a lot of Native American people were talking about how before it had not been really a proud thing to talk about being Native American and, and Indian in this country because there's been a lot of racism, discrimination towards people who uh, have been oppressed like that. And people, and if you remember, out of that came a whole sort of rejuvenation of Native American identity and culture in this country. A lot of laws were changed. Uh, a lot of people got degrees and went to school, became professionals. And, 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 but, and there was also a lot of other smaller wounded knees that took place after that, too, uh, that were a part of this whole movement. And a lot of people went to jail. On, on Pine Ridge itself, after the original event, we lost about 50 people to the FBI and the BIA police uh, counterintelligence, you might want to call them terrorist squads, that killed a lot of the activists, the younger people who were it's a second level of leadership kind of thing. But by, the, by now, 50 years later, I can see they tried, but they didn't stop anything. All they did was just make it through fuel on the fire, you know. There's just more people out there, and they know about it. And that uh, that struggle is not going to go away. So right. so that was, that was really a great time. Thank you very much. You know, you're a real part of history, man. It's, uh, you've really lived some real history, movement history in our time. Let's talk now about your current peace work in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and what's happening at Kirtland Air Force Base. Kirtland yeah. spelled K-I-R-T-L-A-N-D, and it's right there in your city. Uh, and they play a huge role in moving the arms race into space. So talk about what's going on there, some of the history, and why is it so important to track and follow what's happening there at Kirtland? And yeah. to, and to protest it as well. The uh, in my own life experience, I, I did a lot of work in steel mills 
and did some labor organizing for a while. And then I decided I want to go uh, get an advanced degree and uh, go to do I was going to get into teaching. I needed to figure out to do something. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll try and get into college teaching. And I moved back to Albuquerque and I got here. And for a while, I was just sort of watching the town, looking around. And there's an air base here, Kirtland Air Force Base and Sandia National Labs and the Los Alamos National Lab. Most people know New Mexico for the uh, development of the atomic bomb, the nuclear weapons that were used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and uh, the whole arsenal thing. And so that is real big here. And I was, I had started going to uh, the university and I started reading press releases and stories and things around here. And I began to see that there was something else going on that was, uh, that was very um, uh Interesting, you can might say. And that's along the ways when I met you. Um, you came out one day for a visit and gave a talk here to our little group. And I think it was the uh, U.S. had a, the Russian, one of the Russian satellites that they had somehow gotten a hold of and they were parading it around. And, and we had a demonstration there. And that sort of keyed my interest. I had always been in, interested in space and I, the space for peace thing slogan that you come up with and <laughs> i thought to myself that makes sense why would we want to put weapons in space and what's going on about that and it, it made me curious and i started digging into it and, and following what was going on here in albuquerque and it turns out that this uh, base out here that had been formed in world war ii as a part of the, coming out of the depression and they started a, a war base here later on for the war was now not only supporting nuclear weapons research and development, but they were doing a lot of things around space weapons. Uh, and they like to brag about it. They put press releases in the paper and the university had little articles about it. And so I began to look at that and uh, and say, you know, what, what's really going on here? And, and just, I don't know, it's a long story, but to cut it short, digging into it over the years, I found out that this base out here is a part of the, it's now part of the Space Command. And they have been doing a lot of early weapons research on um, militarizing space. Uh, Reagan had started the SDI program, the Strategic Defense Initiative in the 80s, and it was all classified and everything. And I began to realize that one of the things that they had created, and it was a top secret thing out here for a while, just a few miles from here, my house down here on the side of the mountain, on the out on the base where you can't get to it, they had created an anti-satellite weapon uh, called Starfire. And it was classified for a long time, and it was called a, a, an, observa uh, an observatory. Like it was a big mirror kind of thing on the ground that they could rotate and play with and change the uh, apertures on the uh, settings and everything, and it would produce really clear pictures. They said it was equivalent of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, in space. And it's true, it will. It takes the twinkle out of stars. When you look up at starlight in the night sky, they can actuate the mirror. It's called adaptive optics. And chain and remove the flutter and the twinkle, and you get a pure image. And in the Clinton minute, when Clinton came into office, he declassified a lot of this stuff for some reason for a short period of time. And I heard that they were going to do an open house out there. So me and some of the other elderly peace activists here got on the bus with the press journalist one day. And we went down there and walked around this thing. And I looked at it. And, and what I've come to find out on it was, yeah, it, it is an, an astronomy kind of instrument. But it has a dual use. You can change the modulation of, of energy back through the mirror and, and send it back out into space as well as you can look at light coming down. And it's an anti-satellite weapon that had been built in the secret um, long ago, coming out of the Reagan administration is what it, what it was. And the United States have been trying to knock down Soviet uh, satellites since 1958, when Sputnik went up in 57, they tried a number of tem uh, times to shoot them down, but they never were able to do it. This thing, though, had the capability of burning up the sensors. It wouldn't destroy one or blow it up, a satellite, but it would mess it up. And so now there's a whole bunch of those things. And so they got me interested in like, well, this base over here has been doing a lot of this stuff. And I found out about this thing, so I began to follow it more. And what I discovered was they're really heavily into directed energy weapons. 
they developed a, a series of weapons out here during, and they used them in Iraq for a while, but they were ethically a problem for them. They could burn people's skin and boil their blood on, on people on the ground with uh, directed energy and beam weapons. Um, and they tested it out here. And then for a while, they were bragging about all this stuff in the newspapers and these super weapons they had created. But it was so bad that they, they couldn't use it. They've got it, and they've turned it into sort of a crowd, crowd control kind of thing. They changed the modulation on it and turned it into a sound um, – terrible sound kind of thing that will blow your eardrums out and everything like that. So they were developing all these weapons out here. They called them non-lethal for a while. Uh, crowd control, space observation things. And then along the way, um, the Space Command idea had been around for a while, maybe to do something. Uh, and then uh, Trump created this, uh, the Space Force. And then um, as a a program separate from the Air Force and everything. And they put a lot of it out here at Kirtland. And and just in following some of the press releases and the news about it, oh, I just got to say that what I discovered is at the university where I was going here, under this whole thing of private-public partnerships that they developed in, under the Reagan days, uh, because they cut taxes and the university public education was hurting. So they encouraged uh, public education like universities to go into partnerships with private businesses in their local areas. Well, this town is full of military contractors uh, who do the work for Sandia Labs and for uh, Kirtland. And so that was coming into the university. And I began to find out that a lot of the faculty and people at the university were doing military weapons research. Um making a lot of money off of it and contracts that were coming in. So I began to look at all that and put it back together. And then uh, Trump comes along and creates a space force and they uh, make the Kirtland. Kirtland was in the running to be the headquarters for it, but they didn't make it there. I think the second level on it or something now. Um, But uh, the commander of the the program was uh, here at Kirtland for a while and they issued a statement uh, one time that really it really made me worried because uh, they said that things in space, in terms of satellites being attacked, um, us attacking other things like that, is it's a real crowded area. So many uh, satellites up right now, probably tens of thousands, uh, communication satellites and military surveillance satellites by many countries. You you know more about this than I do. Uh, he said, you know, things happen so fast that we can't always determine in the human brain what's happening. If that's an attack or just an accident, maybe something is colliding and running into each other. So we're going to turn over this decision making to sat- uh, to computers uh, to make the decision whether to fire back or to take this as a hostile act. And that just really, really scared me because, you know, the, now we got these bat- tactical battlefield nuclear weapons that are that we position all over Europe in the NATO countries, and Russia has pulled up some too to that area, and they're turning over this whole thing of the the, the space is really heavily for surveillance um, and communications on the battlefield. Now, whoever controls space is going to control the ground. You can't fight on the ground anymore without controlling space too. Right. So there's One a big thing, conflict uh, going on. Let me interrupt you a minute. One thing you talked about yeah. years ago uh, was how at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, there were part of the university that were sort of fenced off. It was a public university, but now they were top secret. <clears throat> Talk about that a bit. There's um, what I what I began to along the way. Um, there was a big article they put out about the e bomb. There was a thing called the electronic e bomb, electric bomb that would destroy a lot of other. Uh, communications and systems on the ground. They, they used it in Baghdad in the opening days of shock and awe. Um, and I began to look, and, and, the, and the university was bragging about how they had uh, developed it here, some of the faculty. And I began to find out that there were areas in the university that were sealed off. You couldn't get to them anymore. Um, where they had developed these some labs and places and buildings and, and stuff like that. And then I began to find out there's a lot of research that goes on here. It was classified. Uh, I, I Through the FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, I got a lot of uh, information on the research contracts, and they were marked 
that there was ta- a secret, secret level that the faculty couldn't even talk about what they were doing. So there were whole areas here like that. And the faculty uh, might have an office on the campus, but they were actually working out at Kirtland Air Force Base for for the uh, programs and work that they were doing. So uh, it was really inter, intermixed and intertwined. On Is that what you were thinking about? Um, there's been so much over the years of these things that we've discovered here that um, it's unbelievable. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, that's 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 it. We're just about out of time. Mm. Why don't you take a minute or so and just do kind of a wrap up about why you think this uh, space issue is so important? And, yeah, and thanks, Bruce, for all the work that you've done on developing the consciousness for so many people around the world on this. It's it's uh, hit touch people like me, and then I've been able to go out and talk to other people about it here too. Um, if God, Whoever controls space is going to control the planet nowadays because of the communications and the way that things have developed. And on the battlefield, um, that's uh, ultimate area is really. I just think it's dangerous. I mean, they're good. They're each. It's like the satellites that Musk has put up for communications that they're using in Ukraine. Um, Russia has threatened those things because it's using civilian. Uh, communication satellites for military purposes. And it just opens up a whole area that's unchartered and there's no agreements on anything. Private sector is getting into war using satellites. And if a country, whoever it is, decides it could be India and Pakistan or China and and any other country decides to start taking out these satellites to stop this battlefield on the ground, we're going to have a catastrophe of things that we unbelievable our communications will go down uh, a lot of things that we take for granted today in a normal life will just end and um it, and it could it could escalate i i i don't know my own mind is i think that they've also experimented with putting nuclear weapons in in orbit to use on the ground but you know that's that's all kind of speculation but i think that uh, they have gone that far with that x34 uh, program so it really worries me because we, I mean, we could lose a whole lot of the world around us if the, the if these satellites and communications go down. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bob. I'm sorry to cut you short, but oh, uh, it's a pleasure you. to pleasure to have you on, and thank you for all the work you've done and for the, all the support you've given the Global Network over many many years. We appreciate it and love you for it. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you for watching another edition of Space Alert. Uh, We'll do another show soon with another leader from uh, the peace movement in, in another part of the world. Until then, good luck to you all, and please get organized.